Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the University of New South Wales. I'm David Burt. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship here at the university. Um, and I'm really excited for today. This is such an important topic. Um, here at the university, I'm very fortunate to lead something called the Founders Program. And the Founders Program is a philanthropically funded team that helps people start and grow companies. I'm very fortunate to work with hundreds of founders um, across the years, and this is really an evergreen topic. This kind of question of the emotional highs and lows of um, just how torturous it sometimes is to start something new. Um, uh, and so really looking forward to, to diving into the insights today. Um, one of the things that really drove this home for me was um, I was speaking with the founder one day and he was sort of sharing the story of one day he went home, sat down with his wife and he said, I've got something really important to talk about with you. We just got a million dollars for our startup for the, for the, um, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, amazing celebrations. He got on a plane, he went to Seattle, um, the full circus song and dance, got to meet Bill Gates, comes back a week later, walks in the door, sits down, goes, got something really important we need to talk about. We can't pay our mortgage this month. Got a young family, wife doesn't quite understand. Like, what do you mean? Like last week you just said a million dollars came in. Why can't we pay our mortgage? Uh, well, that money's for the business. It's a grant. We, could, we can't spend it on our mortgage. Um, and that really, when I kind of heard that story about 10 years ago now, um, really drove home for me. The kind of journey of a founder has those moments of euphoria and terror, um, week to week, day to day, sometimes during the same day. Um, and so this is a really evergreen topic that I think a lot of founders go through. Um, so we're very fortunate to have an expert in the topic to share um, some of his research and insights with us. Um, so um, Professor George Fawcett is a professor of management um, at Stanford University. Um, he's the chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Fostering Entrepreneurship. Um, and through that um, has sort of really led the publishing of a number of um, really important reports that have changed the way that, you know, we think about economic and development um, and, and entrepreneurship from a government perspective. Um, additionally, he's um, been a director or advisor to many venture capital firms and startups, um, has really demonstrated the bridge between academia and, and putting into practice in business. Um, so his research has, has caused a lot of um, really valuable um, sort of impact in, in the business community, which is fantastic. Um, he's also um, a member of the Order of Australia for his work, so has that recognition from the Australian government as well. Um, and I'm just really grateful that you reached out to us to, to share your research with us. So Thanks. with that, everyone, please welcome Professor George. Foster. Thanks, David. Um, see, so I just make sure these, yeah, it works. Um, yeah, so really appreciate you coming. Um, just a background to the research topic. Um, at Stanford, I do uh, two areas. One is uh, sports management and the other is entrepreneurship. And in the entrepreneurship area, I teach it with a uh, colleague, uh, Scott Brady. And Scott, uh, when he was younger, he, he's about 52 now, but when he was younger, he was with a CFO of a company that went IPO. He came back to Stanford in his early 30s and he started up a venture that uh, really is the first of three ventures that he did. Very, very successful. He owned a lot of the fiber towers in the US initially. And so uh, there's a very famous case we do in class on Project Shed of the criteria by which you get together and decide an idea. And so is it an idea looking for a team or is it a team looking for an idea? We have a lot of these debates in class, but Scott, uh, now as, um, as chairman, effectively chairman of uh, Eric Smith's, well, Eric's the chairman, but Eric Scott's got to do a lot of the investments in Eric Smith's $1 billion fund. So Eric Smith was the founder of, uh, not, he was the ch CEO of Google, the two Google twins who came out of Stanford. Uh, the VCs wanted to put some adult supervision, if you like, on them. Uh, and um, Eric Schmidt was the person brought in. Uh, subsequently, Eric, let's suppose he's worth 14 or 15 billion, but he set aside 1 billion for a private fund and Scott does that. I think they're probably investments up to about 3 billion. And so Scott, I remember when Silicon Valley Bank uh, broke, uh, we were doing a class on a Thursday and it started to break on the Thursday and, and the class we were doing on the Monday afternoon and Scott was on nine boards. Uh, all of them banking with Silicon Valley Bank. And so, and the way Silicon Valley Bank worked is that you had to do all your business with Silicon Valley Bank. That was the deal, which made it very difficult when you're trying to get your money out, you don't have a banking relationship in another bank. And so everybody now is starting to say, don't buy into this singular 
relationship at all. And that's part of the theme that I'll talk about here is the riskiness of the single, whether it's the single customer, the single key person, the single partnership of those type of things. Um, the background of this research is that initially when I was starting to teach this area, we'd write cases and the, the students would react somewhat to the strategy and you'd have a heavy duty discussion on strategy, but where, and we'd always have an entrepreneur in the room from the case, and the students reacted mostly to the story of a high or a low moment. And I mean, some of the low moments were much more gripping than the high moments uh, on that, but, so I started to say, this is really an interesting question. And so in the first World Economic Forum report I did, uh, we had 73 case studies from different parts of the world. And oh, just by the way, ask questions all along the way. Uh, David said it's far better and I can ask people if anybody's seen that issue uh, on that. But uh, in that report, um, the World Economic Forum, the way that business model of that organization works is that they need a certain number of high-end sponsors to pay 500,000, 750,000 to get seats at Davos. So they're all the time looking for, is there a set of young companies that we can groom, and that's probably not a great word these days, but we can sort of bring along and introduce them to the forum and whatever benefits they see from it. So as they get to be, uh, so the Google twins actually were what we call young tech pioneers in that organization and subsequently become uh, a fully paid member. So can we identify in global around the world some early stage companies? And, and I was already in the forum through the sports area uh, on that and they said, well, you do sports, you do international, could you sort of lead the charge on that? And so I did, and then I did a second study where we did the same thing. And every one of those studies, we had cases at the back and one of the questions was, what were some of the low moments of your entrepreneurial journeys? And then over time, I started to think, that's a little unbalanced, I wanna do the high moments as well as the low moments. And we were distinguishing between a high low moment at the company level and a high moment at the individual level, and the same thing with the low moments. And so when I was doing, and I do a lot of executive programs at Stanford, and it got to the stage where I would ask people before they come to the program, give me an example of a high and a low moment. And so I, I, I've got like about 2,000 of these examples, uh, probably about 500 examples, but there's a high and a low moment at a company and the individual. And so I said, the, the difficult with that database is 500 anecdotes. And, and I don't really get the ability to look at, okay, what did you learn from it? Uh, could I do a follow-up interview? So about a year ago, I decided to design this survey instrument, which I mean, I'd like to thank those who filled it out. If you haven't, I'd love to get some more responses on that. Um, but in that, um, one of the last questions was, uh, we may do a follow-up interview uh, with you, depending on what it looks like. And so the last three months, I've done about 110 interviews on Zoom, uh, probably 45 to an hour each interview, and then I do write-ups afterwards. And so part of what we'll be talking about, more from the interviews than it is from the surveys, um, the object here is actually to end up with a book. And, and I mean, I've searched, I know this pr literature pretty well at the corporate level as well as the individual practitioner level. And there's not really a book that systematically takes the categories of an early stage company. If you think of the arc of a journey of an early stage company and talks about, okay, here are five or six most common low moments or high moments you're gonna face as a team of founders. And then what, do you do, what are some of the ways at which these have been handled? And it's really the latter part, what you learn from it, the way it's handled, is where the richness of the study will come in. Okay, so that's where it is. Um, I, uh, it's probably halfway through, so probably June of next year is when I will sort of finish the project on that, depending, because I do a fair amount of teaching. Okay, so, um, so the background of the survey is that we ask, uh, what is a low moment? And uh, so, you know, some of the responses from Australia are coming in, I mean, funding dried up all at the stage, or we did a trial uh, and we didn't get market traction from the trial. Uh, how do we sort of handle that situation? Uh, and then how do you respond and what are the key learnings? What are the key things? And we do the same thing on the high moments. So um, I have been categorizing these things for a whole lot of decades in terms of the issues that early stage companies run into. And uh, what I've put them into 10 different bu buckets here. Not all the same frequency, but what you can see is, and I'll go through about four or five of these in the, in the talk and ask people, has anybody seen examples of these as well? But uh, so th these are often, the, the challenge has a multi-facet to it. And what starts out as a challenge or a high moment, when you start to say, how do you handle it? 
it's different from if it's say a top, uh, let's suppose it's a market opportunity, the market opportunity, I could clearly classify the, the low or high moment as a market opportunity. What you learned about it is often something to do with people. And so one of the, the major topics that comes out here is the over-indexing of people as a challenge, as a problem in dealing with early stage companies uh, on that. And so um, this is, uh, that's just a subcategorization, but um, this is for the first hundred of the interviews I've done. And what you'll find is that there is a differential. Uh, so if you take the top management, then 16 out of 100 are top management uh, issues, okay? And, and so, but if you looked at what were the takeaways of low moments, com they can come from any one of those 10 categories, S 21 of them are coming from, from top people related issues. And so what, and what you'll find, and this is the way best highlight, is that uh, the over-indexing of people, which is the takeaways, is in red. And you can see that even though 15% of say the low moments or, high, or low or high moments are in people-related issues, a full 40% of them relate to people in terms of the key takeaways. And you'll see that as we go through uh, on that. So let's take the first category. What are some of the, the high or low moments in terms of top management? Well, the first one I'll go through, and some of these are, are examples, and I'll ask uh, after each one, has anybody got a similar story on this? Um, one of the students at Stanford had a, a company called TRX. And this is a piece of exercise equipment. I don't know, has anybody seen TRX where there are a set of straps and you attach them to the door? Well, Randy Hetrick was one of our MBAs. He was a special forces. And so he was stuck in Sudan uh, and he wanted to keep fit. So he got some straps and sort of developed this thing where he could sort of, it, there wasn't obviously a gym in the middle of Sudan that he could go after of that, especially if he's off base. And so he developed this piece of exercise equipment. And so what Randy did is he decided that he would try and set it up as a company. And he chose his best friend, his best man, at his wedding to do it with him. And um, in the way he, they allocated the equity, you take 40%, I take 40%, uh, which even at that stage was a little bit of a stretch for his, his partner. And this is, it, Randy's quite open with this, so I'm not betraying any confidence of private confidence, but they had a falling out with each other. And, and it's not, it wasn't pretty uh, on that stage. And so how do you handle the conflict between the two of them? Uh, where they both got embedded 40% in the equity. And, and so and, uh, Randy's comment was, never be blinded by your own hopes for somebody else, right? And so he really wanted to see his co-founder do well. It was his best man at his wedding. And the expression is, you know, friends and family become in-laws and enemies, okay? And uh, I think, unfortunately, he switched from the friends and families to the enemies sort of bucket on that. And so it was, it was ugly. And so it seems like an obvious thing to do, but you know, the reason what he should have done is done staged equity. So they said, okay, we, you will take 10% each and then depend, and you could do this in terms of time. So if you stay with the firm as a co-founder for four years, then you get 10%, 10%, 10%. That would be a time-based allocation, or you could do it on milestones, okay? If, if you're in charge of sales, let's have a look at what the sales is going on that. Unfortunately, they didn't. And so, again, uh, one of the themes is make original mistakes. Don't repeat the mistakes that other people you've done in the past or things that you've uh, seen other people do. And part of what we're doing in this study is trying to do a little bit of a categorization of people reflecting and say, this is a problem that we ran into. I don't want to do this again. One of the examples that, um, that you would say a low moment for Randy and his takeaway was, was uh, t two things, you mean just don't believe what you want to believe in somebody. Uh, the second thing associated with that was very much in terms of this stage equity. Now, I'll get that in a minute. Another one which you call is differences in uh, where the, the CEO consistently blames others. And we've got quite a, I mean, frequently in the larger database, the surveys, well, the narcissistic CEO or whatever you want to call them is a, is a frequently observed phenomena uh, on that. And I think part of the, the style is um, a lot of these people come out of large companies and think they can do this stuff. And they're so used to having a militaristic style operation 
uh, on that. And when they get into a smaller company, they've got to do jack or jill of all trades. And they have a really difficult problem in terms of debate coming up from the, the ground level to them. And, and so, and I give you an example of this uh, where we had a, a team of four of the students across the Sampa campus set up a company uh, where they were building satellites to go up in the sky and do high resolution photography. And um, they were doing reasonable progress, but the VCs wanted to sort of say, okay, you're not, let's bring in a superstar CEO. And they brought in a superstar CEO. And he was a sort of a narcissist in the extreme. Okay, and so one of the students who comes to class, who was CEO of the company, gets downgraded on that. And here's the horrible situation. Does he leave because he's been demoted or does he stay in the venture? And he went through this agonizing situation of what should he do? And the other three founders said, you know, if you leave, we leave. And he said, well, we came on this mission together, not just for money. We came on this mission because we're coming out of the engineering school, one was out of the business school, three out of the energy. We want to do satellites in the sky. We've got the money to do it. We're having success along the way. Let's hang in there. And so they, they stomached the, the narcissistic CEO. And I remember I was sitting in class and I had both the new CEO come to class and the former CEO. And uh, it was an hour and five, it was 105 minutes class. And after an hour, the CEO left because he had some other things to do. And I turned around to the old CEO and I said, so what's it like being demoted in front of the students? And he said, oh, it's effing sucks. And, and, he, and he sort of totally <coughs> opened up to the class because he'd been dead silent for 60 minutes uh, on that. And it was like an incredibly revealing moment of this person who had sort of seen the venture as a CEO downgraded. And then what happened is he's got to live through somebody who is not getting a lot of respect. It turns out that venture, Google acquired it for about 350 million cash. And um, they gave the keys to the building, the Google building to the four founders, but the other, the new CEO never got in the building. They said, we don't, that deal with that guy that we contract with, see you later. Yeah. Investor management misalignment on this. And this is an example where often the story is, is that the VC company wants you to grow at a faster pace than the CEO, right? Uh, I did a, a, a work with a company and a radication on this called Style Seed. And what this lady did, it was a portal where that was, if you were sort of doing um, online registry of haircuts and, and stylists, you could be in New York and say, okay, I need to have a style done uh, in the next 24 hours. You could go on this site and say, here are 27 stylists in New York, here is reputation indexes for them, here are the times they're available. So it was basically a, uh, what we call a platform model for stylists and customers to come together. And the venture firm was Lightspeed, and they said to Melanie, um, you know, go big or go home. And, and she said, you go home and I'll go medium. Okay, That's, that was her response. She said, I'm not putting all my life into an undiversified ex exploration uh, on this. And one of the few times, uh, I know the, the VC, because he gave me the access to Melanie, he said, we sort of decided that it was best to sort of support her, but not continually put money in there. And so he still is an advisor too. He said, that's one of the few times we backed off. Because uh, normally the game we would play is that we'd, let's put in some, a new CEO and just turf them out. Uh, but, but it happens, you know, this is sort of, and she, she sort of, you know, the way she described it was triumphant. You know, it's sort of a high moment that she was one of the few people who survived to tell them, not your way, it's my way, uh, which, which is an interesting one. one of the, the most important thing is the importance of due diligence. And if you think about due diligence uh, on this, one of the hardest areas to do due diligence on is how do the senior employees react under stress? Because this happens all the time. And the, the, the sort of feedback that you'll be given by the person you're interviewing, he's not gonna tell you too much about stress unless he thinks he's done a great job. I mean, that's just not the nature of interviews uh, on this. So if the person has been through one or two companies before, what the recommendations of people who've thought about this issue in, in the surveys, and that is, let's have a, do a very deep dive on the companies he's been with and go into all the high and stress moments that that company's had, find out key employees who were there at the time and find out how he handled it. 
Okay, and because and and most of these people will not be on his reference list, but but due diligence. If you're putting in a senior management person, and you get it wrong, you can get it very wrong, right? Um, I remember uh, in terms of due diligence, and and this is a real red button. If somebody say I'm a startup doing enterprise software, and I think I've got to be have somebody who's good at on the other side has been with an enterprise type company, then why don't we bring that person as head of marketing? I remember sitting down, I got a call from a CEO and said, um, this, the head of marketing who we brought in from this large company is unhappy. I said, I know that, I've heard that story. Uh, he's told quite a few times. He said, I want you to talk to him about the situation. I said, well, that's not my role. I mean, your role is actually the, the person to talk to them. You're the CEO. He said, yeah, but we don't get on that well together anymore. I said, well, okay, I'll talk to him. And, and I sat down and, and this guy just ranted and ranted for about 20 minutes. And I got sick of it. And I said to him, you know, you're complaining about when you were in this company, and I heard this like six or seven times, when I was working for this larger company, they did this. I had an assistant. And he said, she made all the reservations and stuff like that. And I said to the person, you know, the person who makes the reservations this company is the person who you shave in front of in the morning. And he looked at me and he took about 30 seconds of process and he said, that's a really smart ass comment, isn't it? I said, no, it's a serious comment. And I said, you've got to accept the fact that, that that's, you don't have the infrastructure in place. And they said, and by the way, we turn right on planes, not left on planes when you get on the plane. And, and so he was so used to suites, not rooms, and, and different classes of hotels, and those type of things. And you sort of say, okay, find out about this because you hire somebody like that, it takes you three to four months at least to hire them. You find out six months later that's not working out. And then so you waited a year, you lost a year in terms of motivating and some momentum for the company on a key function uh, on that. So I think it's, that's really important uh, on that. I'm, I'm actually a, um, a fan of really 360 degree evaluations uh, in terms of up and down. I think one of the problems is that some of the CEOs actually that we put in these early stage companies are good at managing down, but not managing up to the board. And you'll see quite a few situations there will be conflicts between the board and a CEO. And, and those things can get pretty quickly off the rails, unless there's sort of some guardrails established right at the start uh, on that. How do they handle difficult conversations? And I'd, and I'd actually encourage anybody sort of run into problems where they've dealt with somebody who just can't handle difficult conversations. Anybody seen that? Yeah, do you want to just say what, what it was? Uh, I put some money into a company. Oh, sorry. <coughs> I put some money into a company oh, right. okay. and uh, <laughs> I offered, I asked him if uh, he'd put some money in and he started shouting at me. I said, wow. <laughs> and uh, he said the reason was, well, he had his career invested in it, so he'd made the investment. Yeah. And yeah. I thought, fair enough. But then later on, I found he shouted at everyone. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you right. know, you learn from those initial interactions. And, and I mean, it takes, a, I mean, there's nothing, the way somebody's, the way I approach that sometimes is there are different managerial styles and there are certain people who can work well with somebody who screams at them. Uh, but over time, most people can't. And so I, I wrote a case on a, a, a CEO executive in the sporting industry, Rick Waltz, who was at the NBA for 20 years and then two clubs for 10 years, Golden State Warriors and Phoenix Suns. And the head of the NBA at that stage was a fellow called David Stern for 30 years. And David's work style was pretty much to scream at people uh, on that. And so part of the case talks about how Rick Welts handles that. And he had the ability actually to not be intimidated by that work style, whereas some other people in the organizations didn't. And, and I interviewed one of the other persons. She said one of the remarkable things about Rick Welts was he could handle the, the rants of David Stern's and when he couldn't, we'd all suffer, okay? And, and so, and she said, it was amazing to see how the differences in abilities to handle that style of management. And I think this is gets the, the stress point. When, when stress hits the organization, that's where you see people who have got a deep rudder and can sort of do that or else they sort of just lash out. One of the hardest things of early stage companies 
that are founded by people who have never been in early stage companies is you don't have enough of a background to do the sort of deep dive into their, their, their due diligence. And so I think that's, I think that's where I think, uh, I know that the most popular course, one of the two most popular courses at Stanford is called Touchy Feely. And this is difficult conversations. And, and the students, the first three weeks, they, they're in tears. They're, I don't react that to way to criticism. Well, yeah, yes, you do. Five out of six people have said you do. So, you know, how do you, how do you want to get your act together uh, on that? So you can sort of, and there are, there are ways at which people are now doing personality tests. Now, I'm not a fan of a battery of personality tests, but three of the responses here said their strong recommendation after a series of quite negative outcomes in hiring senior talent was to go through quite a bit of personality tests on these things. So um, don't wait till the stuff hits the fan. You know, I think that is the message. Um, this difficult conversations is a really important one. Um, give me an example uh, that I ran into. Um, I was working with um, John Bertrand on the, um, not the 83 one, but the later one where in San Diego, there was a, it's called One Australia. And this was the boat that sank, broke in half and sank to the bottom of the sea. And, and I remember actually, um, it, the one who won it there was a, a New Zealand boat and they had a beer called Stein Lager. And so uh, they brought out and had, what goes down quicker than Australia won? A Stein Lager. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was actually pretty clever that they could move that quickly. But um, we were trying to raise 40 million for the syndicate and 10 million we were trying to raise out of Pacific Dunlop. And the head of Pacific Dunlop at that stage uh, is long since passed, but um, he uh, was on the back of the tracker boat for Bertrand's boat with me. And um, what happened is that uh, he'd gone to dinner with Bertrand and, and Bertrand's wife the night before, and Raza, and she said to me, you're in charge of uh, the fellow John Goff uh, at the back of the boat. And at that stage, Pacific Dunlop had taken over a medical devices company, heart implants. And there's some faulty wirings that they discovered after they did the acquisition. It was terrible due diligence. It was faulty wires in the, the heart implants. And he said, so what do you think is a reasonable allocation for uh, contingent liabilities for this? And he showed me this number. And I think, let's suppose they paid 320 million for this venture. And they had had something like 20 million or 30 million as the the contingent liability for that. And I said, you know, I think you're missing at least one zero. I said, uh, and this, and then, so this is like half an hour into a two and a half hour boat ride with just a couple of us at the back of the boat. And he said, are you telling me that I paid more, I'm gonna lose money before I even start this company because what you're telling me is the contingent liabilities is much more than they paid for the whole company. I said, I'm not telling you that at all. I'm telling you what I think the contingent liability is and you can work out the rest. Well, that was a pretty ugly, and, and he just couldn't handle the situation on that. And so, uh, I mean, I could imagine in, in executive meetings where there's much more of a different role that it would could get pretty ugly at times. And so that's, you've got to assess those sort of personalities in your business. Low moments in people and team. Um, so I think one of the most interesting things is you run into people who are not scaling. So in an early company, you're actually doing a whole lot of tasks, aren't you? So you don't have functional areas of responsibilities. And so what you're trying to do is as you build scale, you end up with a more functional set of responsibilities on that. And then the question is, how do you bring in people who have got deep functional responsibilities, who may actually not be in existing a company, and yet in the company itself may be some people who are good at the first 12 months, 18 months, at Jack or Jill of all things, but don't have the deep functional expertise. And yet these people who have been with the organization, incredibly loyal, incredibly great, but they're not gonna scale in the way that's required by the business. How do you sort of handle that situation? And, and actually, uh, again, this is a case that we, we've done and it's in the public domain. Uh, University of New South Wales graduate uh, set up a company and in, in, um, it's an online um, wedding registry, Solar, Charlene Ma. And so she came to Stanford, she was 206 grad, and then she worked for Yahoo, and then she worked for a company called Guild. 
and about 2.13 she set up this wedding registry and people were sort of saying, oh, Charlene, you know, wedding registries, you know, there's plenty of them about. And she says, yeah, but they're all large corporations using this as a distribution channel for their business as opposed to I'm going to be purely wedding registry online and I'm going to, because her expertise was, was in what you call online um, branding, online graphics, those type of things, fabulous mind and that sort of stuff. I think she's first class honors in marketing out of UNSW. And um, so she set up the company on that and she and it was going like this. And, and the last financing round was about 500 million. And so it's very, a very big success story. In fact, I, I would think it's out uh, of UNSW is one of the most important success stories out there. And um, she talked about at a management offsite the need to get some more expertise in the operations, CO role, the finance type of thing, because she viewed her expertise as much more in the graphics, the, those type of She was going to be CEO, but she was looking for president. And um, she said she probably didn't handle it well. She should have thought about not just throwing that out as a line at an offsite, we may need to bring in somebody from the outside, because immediately in the meeting, people sort of said, well, what about me? I've been here a while. And so um, over time, the person that she's brought in, it wasn't external, I think everybody's really thrilled with Charlene's choice. Charlene's very thrilled with her uh, division of responsibilities on that. But she said, reflecting back, that was not the forum to sort of raise those sort of issues. And you could sort of see several people in the organizations going home at night saying, why am I being overlooked? And, and they say they may leave. Now, not because not everybody leaves is necessarily the bad thing in the world, but, but basically you've got to handle these things much more delicately. Uh, down rounds is when you do the last round of financing at a lower amount than the previous round of the financing on that. And so the lot of ugly, anybody been involved in a down round? Are you okay? What, what was the situation? Uh, the CEO and one of the board members were running the company too many expenses and the, they started running out of money and then they said, we'll finance it at a really low price. Yeah. And then the founder were horrified and they said they'd go out and look for money uh, separately independently of those two. And they, they raised the money and all the staff cut their pay uh, to try and help the company get through it. And then a few years later, they just got a stock market. Well, that's a success story, in terms of, but the, the short run, a, a lot of the down rounds, what happens is that there's a common shareholding and a preferred shareholding, and a down round, you know, sort of the common really gets wiped out. I mean, really ugly uh, in terms of the down rounds. And um, up to about mid-2000, I'd say March, April of 2022, valuations were sort of like this. And what you've seen is firms trying everything not to finance at the moment because if they did it'd be a down round uh, on that so you know that's where I think in Australia some of the superannuation funds are sort of saying okay let's have a look at some of the ventures that we'd put at 60 40 billion 50 billion now worth 28 billion or something like that and you can imagine what happens those people who joined the company and stock options were when the company was at a 40 billion valuation now some of these stock options are not just underwater they're subterranean and, and, and so you have to basically restructure the whole equity thing uh, on that. Uh, another issue that comes up here is when an acquisition occurs, uh, how do you sort of handle the existing management versus the uh, ones who are going to stay with the company uh, on that? No, I can get to that in a minute. Um, I think um, where in corporate ventures on the people, one of the, I'll show you what the takeaways on this, um, one of the, the challenges here on the people is to try and get better aligned cultures uh, on that. And part of it to say, okay, what, what are the typical misalignments that may occur in cultures, in organization? Is it got to do with the timelines? Is it got to do with the financing? Is it got to do with the personalities on these type of things? And if you can sort of um, really have offsites and you talk about, okay, there is a potential problem in misalignment, how, how are we going to resolve it? Because once the misalignment gets stuck in concrete, it's very hard to do something about it. And, and so I, I'm, I'm sort of, they sometimes do this, what is called a pre-mortem. I mean, the post-mortem is where somebody's died and you go back. Pre-mortem is a very common phrase these days where you 
halfway through the venture say, okay, suppose this venture failed in a certain time period, what are the likely reasons it could fail? And let's think about how you could preempt that, either reduce the likelihood of that or the severity of those type of things. And that requires you to start doing scenarios uh, on that. And so, um, and obviously as it gets closer to failure, you're gonna have some sort of fights between the investor base and the non-investor base. And if you've got a preference sharing, so uh, anybody been in situations where it's like a two or three to one preference and, and which to the negative of the common? Anybody? Hamish, you must have had these, haven't you? Uh, I've seen them uh, in the bad old days and they are definitely coming back in the current environment. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if a company, let's suppose you're putting in 20 million into a company and, and then you do a three for one preference, the investors who are the preferred get the first 60 million out. Okay, that's what a three to one means uh, on that, plus the money back. And so you could have a situation where the company sells for 60 million, uh, they pick up everything in the company and the prior investors and in the common don't get anything. And so that's the sort of situations that people have got to think about. And, and you don't want to necessarily end up in that result because uh, it could be that the management team with a restructured incentive plan could do wonders even for the people who've got the three for one preferences. Uh, where this can get sometimes a little ugly is if the venture firm is at the end of a certain stage of their funding routine. So if there's a seven year fund you know, and they're in year six, they may be jumping to sort of say, I, I know this venture could be much larger, but I'm just buying out now and moving on to the next venture because it's been a pain in the ass to deal with these people. You know, if I can walk away with a three to one, I'll do it. And you just leave the other one stranded, uh, basically. Uh, here's some of the examples of high moments. Um, external recognition of team successes. Um, often that can be in terms of winning customer approvals uh, on those type of things. Um, it could be internal milestones. Uh, etc. And it, it's really, most of the people say if you have um, successes on this, try and have the celebration of successes early related to the event as possible because other things start to get in the, the way of those type of things. Um, another indicator of that is very low labour turnover. Uh, so one of the cases that I've done is uh, I was on Zoom. And so uh, Zoom comes out of, um, there was a company called Webex and Cisco acquired Webex and Eric Yuan, who's the CEO of, of uh, Zoom, was in Webex. And then he became head of a group in Cisco and then he went out on his own uh, on that. And so um, I remember in June of 2020, this is three months into COVID, uh, Zoom's volume has gone like this. It's just rocketed like anything. And so I get, I said, this would be fun. I'm forcing all the students, we're forcing all the students at Stanford to do Zoom. And I said, this is for better or for worse. And I said, they would love to know a case on Zoom. So I wrote to Eric and he'd done one of our executive programs at 10.02. And this is the things you never forget. 10.02. 10.05, I get an email back from Eric. George, I remembered your lectures, terrific lectures. The whole management team's open to you. I said, holy shit, you know, like, mm -hmm. that's absurd. And, and so one of the things that goes on in Zoom is that they believe this culture of happiness. Happy customers, happy employees, happy partnerships. And I was sort of cynical, you know, like, oh, we all want happiness, you know, this is sort of airy-fairy stuff. And it's not. And every person I interviewed at Zoom, it took me about, the th I did seven interviews with all the senior executives. By the third person, I was a believer. It really was, it's, it's deep ingrained into the culture. And the way it reflected is that they had something like a 2% attrition factor in employees over about a five year period. Now, one of the challenges of Zoom now is that Zoom, now we're in the post COVID era and Zoom is a standalone product and the competitors like Teams and that are packaging. And so Zoom is sort of much more exposed as a business strategy than Microsoft or Google on that. And so they're, the, they're in some sense better placed as an acquisition to some of these other companies. And so it's, it's and actually Zoom is going through the more challenging time where their stock market has gone from here to there. And so some of the stock options 
have to be reset. But the amazing thing is the employee turnover is still being pretty low. Uh, on that, which, and that's an example of strain uh, on that. Um, what are some of the takeaways? I, mean, I said to him, multiple success, do it, immediacy of the feedback on that. Another area uh, and low moments, and, and this is the third category, is when you have major customers and you have exits. Cisco was losing quite a few people uh, in, in, in one of the two, uh, 98, 99. Uh, on that, and people were leaving Cisco. They said, "If we set up a if if we leave Cisco, uh, we won't get two hundred thousand or five hundred thousand, and this company's success will all be worth millions." And so, what Cisco did is created this thing called earnouts, where they would basically invest in the startup that their employees who were exiting there with the right to buy it back with first preference. So, have a first and last preference on buyback. Um, Often that didn't work out because there was a big shift in the environment and, and Cisco didn't get it much and neither did the, the founders. Um, I saw that actually, the, the most extreme example I saw that was um, there was a breakup between Arthur Anderson and Anderson Consulting. And this was 92, I mean, the way that, I mean, Anderson Consulting comes out of Arthur Anderson where they had audit tax and they started doing consulting. And then the partners in the consulting division started to fight with each other. Uh, fight with the tax and audit, and, and it made more extreme is that the, the profitability of the consulting division was multiples of what it was in the tax and audit. And so there was a fight about Anderson Consulting, which suddenly became Accenture, wanted to go out on their own. And so how do you sort of work out the divorce agreement? And so I was the expert for Anderson Consulting in terms of valuing what that was, but, and there was something like 400 companies that Anderson Consulting had invested in and uh, how do you sort of value the 400 companies uh, on that? That was a small part of the argument, but it was, it, it was a very bitter dispute uh, on that. And so that would be an example where they were stranded on that. But basically, a lot of the corporates come in at the latter stage. Uh, there's a real dicey thing on that score because if you bring in, if there's three major players in the industry and you get the partner, of, you become like an, an investor from one of those three, the other two will start to say, we're not interested in you. And, and so it, it becomes much harder to get customers beyond a certain limit if you sort of have take one venture for one, one corporate venture and the other ones say, no, don't do business with that because that's a competitor. Not only are they competitor to us, but they're invested in a competitor of us. So I think that's, that can not be pretty uh, on that. Um, I think one of the most interesting things in, in the low moments is where you have a company that's doing really well and the customer is really thrilled with the product, what you're doing. And then they say, we love what you're doing, but we want more of your mind share. We want more of your talent share on that. And what they were trying to do is you were trying to set yourself up as a product company with all the gross margin and leverage of that. And they're trying to turn you into a service company for themselves, right? And so how do you say this could be your best customer and you're playing them so much they say, there's not enough of what you can give us, we want more. And, and, and you, you have to, in some sense, go back to your management and team and say, should we do this? And you come back to the customer and say, no, we don't want to do that. And the customer says, well, but wait a second, you're our, very important to us. And by the way, we are 60% of your revenue, so do you really want to risk it? And I saw this, one of the, the responses was, this was a Swiss company that was in deep AI. So it was 50 PhDs in a unit there, and there was a startup with 50 PhDs in AI, and they wanted to do fundamentally change the world with AI. And one of their first big revenue sources wanted to basically be, be the outsourced AI unit of that company, which took them in a different direction than the 50 PhDs wanted to do. And so they actually had to say to the, the number two customer saying, we can't take the extra work. And the customer left them and said, there are other AI, AI shops around, sorry. So that, but, it's sort of not an easy situation, but they handled it right. And they said that the really intellectual capital in this company are the 50 PhDs. What do you want? And let's not do something that seems like short-term revenue if we're going to alienate everything the firm was set up to do uh, on that. Um, I think in terms of the, you want to identify uh, what are the gaps that you have in terms of that could cause a customer to leave. 
I think that's part of what you're trying to do is all the time not, not put yourself in. The moment you start to see a customer get very high percentage of your revenues, de-risk. Now, it may be that you have to make yourself far more valuable to that customer so that they don't want to leave you, but that's much harder to do if you're an early stage company. The, the more aggressive way to do it properly is to diversify your customer base as quickly as possible. Not easy for an early stage company because you may only have three or four customers uh, on that. Um, I think uh, an example I've, I've seen that was that uh, there was a company out of Israel called Checkpoint, Checkpoint Software. And Checkpoint was in security and it sort of came out of the Israeli military. And Gil Schwed was the fellow who was one of the co-founders of this. And so if you're in, and Gil at 26 was in charge of internet security for Israel. Okay, pretty bright guy, really. And he comes out of this military unit in Israel that's very, very famous for startups. And so his first customer was Sun Microsystems and he had convinced Sun Microsystems to take his security package and putting in the physical boxes that Sun was selling and you could just imagine the internal software engineers at Sun were up in arms. Wait a second, we have all this expertise that you've always said is the most important attribute of the business, and you're going to this startup in Israel? And, and for the first year, Sun was 67% of the revenues of Checkpoint. And two years later, they were zero because the software engineers internally within Sun won the battle. And it was a political fight not necessarily a what you call a skill i mean the software i think most people would view checkpoint and checkpoint grew enormously a successful company checkpoint had arguably far better software technology but there was a political fight that the sun software engineers won and so that's the, you're exposing yourself to that especially when you know that there are software engineers in your customers who fight you and don't want you to get the business uh, on that. So, I mean, there's plenty of red flags on this stuff that you can look at and say, de-risk now, or at least seriously consider de-risking. Um, there we go for time. Okay. Uh, so what are some of the high moments? Um, some of the high moments are actually where you've got really early product market fit uh, on this stuff. Um, one of the examples that um, I came across here is that um, one of, a couple of our students set up a company and uh, if you go into supermarkets, what happens is that uh, the, what I call the packaged goods have all barcodes on them, don't they? So they know exactly what goes in, what goes out. There's a damage factor that they can put in. They can put a theft factor in uh, on that, what they call shrinkage. And so they, they've got a very good model in terms of databases of when they should be stocking the shelves. You don't go to a supermarket because one has a better Kellogg's Corn Flakes than the others, do you? You go to a supermarket because typically they've got better fruit, better fresh fruit, best, better vegetables, better fish, whatever, on that sort of stuff. Where are the barcodes on the pears? Where are the barcodes on the bananas? Okay, they're not there. And so the order of patent, the order, the mechanism by which you do ordering in the fresh fruit area is much more archaic. And often they will stick the bananas on top of the boxes and the bananas at the bottom sort of just get worse and worse and worse. And, and one of the strategies they do is that take those ones and put them in the smoothies. You know, do it in alternative lower yield use of them. But basically, this, these two students set up and they had a deep interest in food technology. And what they were doing is that they were doing AI to sort of build up a, a database of ordering patterns for the, the, the produce. Uh, on this, and um, this company, they just raised another 120 million at a valuation of about 400, and they've been going since 2017 on that. And so they got the one of the biggest um, retail chains in in California is called Albertsons, which is a package of Safeways and all these sort of ones, and they've got the the California um, account for all of Albertsons on the fresh food. And so they quickly got pretty good market, product market fit uh, on that. And so now uh, a lot of times people say, well, what you got to do in early stage companies is pivot. You hear this all the time, don't you? Pivot to the left, pivot to the right, and those type of things. This company would say, we, we, if you've got product market fit for your first one, you don't have to pivot. Okay? In fact, don't get hung up because everybody sells what you're doing to pivot. 
well, I'm sorry, but we didn't have to. Don't make an excuse of it. Say it's a plus, for heaven's sake. And so I think, I mean, oftentimes you'll have these jargonistic expressions that people throw at you, and, and you'll have entrepreneurs come up here, and I'm sure you've had the same thing, David, and talk about their pivots, right? And, 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 and so everybody starts to say, well, if you haven't pivoted, you haven't succeeded. And I think that's all BS. I mean, there are plenty of times where you've got product market fit early on. Um, here, is, I won't, I'll just show you some of the, the ones here. Let's see do if I get it. This is not moving properly. Uh, yeah, here's some interesting ones in the financing. And so um, I've got a few of the responses back from uh, the audience here, and, and I did the same thing in Melbourne and Perth uh, on that. And often uh, what you find is that one of the low moments is, is struggles with financing. That's a very, very common one uh, on this. And uh, another one is we made endless pitches and we didn't get high quality feedback. Right? And, and so uh, that's another issue. And I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the re responses to that. So this whole area of financing, what are some of the lessons from it? So when you don't get funding from your first 20 proposals, I mean, it's time to sort of look at, is it your problem or their problem? And, and a lot of times you're blaming the other person. They don't get, get it. And, and, so, and, uh, and often if the VC is sitting there, it may be a VC associate, they say, uh, what we'll do, we'll get back to you. You know, and they don't. I mean, that's what I, when I always say, you know, the expression, we'll get back to you, I put not, you know, because that's, that's just not going to happen most of the time. Uh, we, in our class at Stanford, we have a VC come in who has been a CEO of two companies and now CEOs of a, a very large VC fund. He's, I think he's got like about 14 billion on the management. And we have a real pitch to the VC. This is, this is one of my colleagues, Scott Brady's companies, pitch to the VC. And he, for 105 minutes, he talks to the class, this is what I would be telling the VC in my own mind if I'm thinking about this. So every 10 minutes, he stops the pitch and he said, hold on to the class, he turns around to the class and said, what's your take on what's happening at this stage? And the class has to contribute and said, this is what I'm processing. Why am I spending so much time asking about his background? Uh, we haven't got to the valuation yet. He said, but why am I spending this? He said, because I'm trying to find out all these factors that may determine, do I want to invest in this person in addition to do I invest in the idea? And he said, the reason I do this uh, is that I did a lot of pitches in my earlier ventures and I got no feedback. And I vowed when I went to the other side, whether you call it the dark side or whatever side you want to call it, when I went to the other side, I committed myself that I will set the standard in terms of feedback, either simultaneous or after the event. And he requires his associates to, at the end of a presentation, if he's not there, to actually do a memo that he shares with the, with the, other, with the, the, with the pitchers on that. That's very, very unusual. Um, another thing is to say, okay, um, you've got to know who to pitch to. Uh, and, and a lot of these times is you, you, you don't pitch to VC firms, you pitch to VC partners uh, on this. And you sort of say, okay, what sort of deals have this person done before? And a lot of times you're not pitching to VCs. Um, people, if, when they say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to have 27 different pitches, a lot of people are willing to listen to pitches, not because they have any interest in investing money, they want to get up to date on what that industry is doing. Or it could be counterintelligence, that they're, they're thinking of doing their own, they're invested in something already they're not telling you, so they want to suck your brain. Or the other reason is they want to brag to their friends on the golf course, well, I just heard three pitches the other day. You know, this, I'm really important because all these, these people are bringing in new ideas to you and they've never taken up an idea in the world, but they think that's a useful way to spend their money, or spend their, their time at the cost of the VC, at the cost of the entrepreneur, who thought going into that meeting was going to be a potential financer. So I always say what you should do <coughs> is before you pitch to somebody, ask how many ventures have you invested in before? And, and, and ask around, is this a person who has actually put money in or is this person just a listener for any number of reasons? And, and there is a point at which you just say, I don't want to pitch to you. Because, I mean, it's not just the demoralizing effect on yourself. You go back and you suppose you're a company of 20 to 30 people and they know that you've gone out and had a pitch because you're preparing the deck with them and stuff like that. So how'd the pitch go? 
Uh, not so well. Well, this is the 17th pitch that's not gone not so well. How do you think that affects the morale of the people in the organization? So there's this collateral damage that occurs ripples or tidal waves throughout the venture that's not there if, it's, if the person doesn't share that information with you. So uh, I think people over pitch because they don't do a good job of funneling the right people to pitch to. Anybody seen people who just take endless pitches with no intention of investing? We've seen that, haven't we? It's just, it's, it's really, I wouldn't say it's a fraud, but it's, it's more reflects on the people pitching that they didn't do the due diligence to not the pitch. Um, one of the, the fundraiser, uh, this is actually, um, one of the biggest challenges in, in, in uh, actually I'll put, the last one I'll put just in interest of time, uh, when you're getting to sell the company, okay, on a trade sale and stuff like that, then, then there are a couple of situations goes on in terms of earnouts. Now, anybody done an earnout here in a sale of a company? An earnout is where what happens, let's suppose, um, I'll give you an example of, that I knew pretty well. Uh, there was a, a group uh, who set up a cable, they acquired a cable company in the US that was doing something else and they turned it into self-generated contact by um, people. So it was, uh, everybody could download their stuff. And so it was like an early version of TikTok sort of stuff. And uh, one of the uh, Middle East companies acquired it for 500 million but they paid 400 million up front and there was a hundred million holdback and that, was, uh, that holdback was going to be paid if they met mo certain milestones. And, and I looked at the price and said, how the hell did they get to even 300 million or 200 million on that? And so they get to the 400 million and then they said, well, we think we deserve another 100 million. And they asked me and I said, you know, I would shut up. I would just take the 400 million and run. I mean, and, and so they, they said, no, we, and so what happened is they went back to the lawyers for the Middle East investor, and he said, actually, we want to reopen the whole deal because it's not just a matter of the 100 million, we don't think the representations in the first place were accurate. And so the moment you start opening up stuff, the, the moment you don't know, and, and sometimes they're, they're wanting to do that because things have gone south in the last six or nine months, that you can sort of really expose yourself to that. The phrase earn out is a misnomer because most earn outs don't earn out. Right? They, they literally, I've been involved in disputes where if you set, suppose I, I have a software company and I sell it to a larger company that's got a portfolio of products and I say, okay, I'm gonna get an earn out on that. But what happens is the, the company that acquires it changes its strategy and puts you into a portfolio of products that they sell for a single price, right? So you've got an earn out based on the revenues of your own product, and somehow or another, you've got to work out how much of that single price for a portfolio of products is due to me. Well, you can imagine what they've done. I mean, Microsoft had this in the early days when they had, I think it was Word, they Word acquired Word, they had set up in divisions where there was like a Word uh, I mean, there were about three or four different divisions of Microsoft. Each of those people, and one of them, two of them came out through acquisitions. Each of them had their own bonus schemes based on individual sales. And then Microsoft sells a suite of products for a single price. So they run into all fights internally within the organization about revenue allocation. And in an earnout, you know the way the allocations are going to go. They're going to go towards the products that Microsoft had done all the time, not the acquired ones that were stuck with the earnout uh, on that. Uh, one of the, the uplifting comments uh, on this area is that uh, one of our students set up a movie production shop in Mexico. And, and so it was, there's a whole lot of interest in online, I mean, like Netflix and these type of things with movie, independent movie producers. And so she set up this company. And um, the two people out of Disney had been turfed out of Disney and they were trying to do their own roll up of movie production companies all around the world. So they, she was a st standing example out of Mexico. And she said, the, the really high moment was, uh, I got three times what I expected uh, for the trade sale uh, on this one. She said, it was just really phenomenal. And she said, um, and I said, so how was the due diligence process in the, in the acquisition? And she said, living hell. She said, they had more lawyers than we had people. 
They had three divisions of this year all coming in and wanting to do a forensic analysis of everything. I'm trying to focus on the business and as well as on the, on the trade sale itself. And there were two other bidders which was helping drive up the price, but it's consuming me all. And then she said, you know, it, although it was living hell, she said, actually, at the end of the conversation, she said, there were actually two high moments of this. She said, the first high moment was the price that I got. She said, the second high moment was I realized I had the most wonderful husband in the world. And, but for him, this, I would have collapsed. He said, he just hung in the family and was sort of like the glue that stuck everything together. And she said, I, I never said appreciated as much of that. And she said, that's, that's a permanent high that stayed ever since. And so that was like, you sometimes get these little gems at the end of a conversation that'll, it'll, that'll, that'll go in the book. That one's for sure. Okay, is that answer? Yes, um, I still work with St. George Football Club uh, on this. And so one of the things that the, that club was really famous for over the years is bringing people down from the country uh, on that. And so, you, and, and it doesn't have to be, it could be indigenous, but often not. There'll be a, a kid coming out of a town of 800 or something like that. And so when they're the superstar there, and, and so they come down from the country, and it can work both ways. They could have a very hard experience in their first six months, 12 months there. But if they perform really good and get those stages moved to the first grade state, everything sort of really, the bad news sort of goes away because they've lived through that and that was one of the costs of getting there. And so they don't really think about the low moments. It can work the other way in that the, the player who comes down and it doesn't succeed in the way and then goes back to the town is a failure because everybody had this false expectation. He's gone down to the big smoke to, because he's going to be successful. And so you have this difficult situation of after the fact, I mean, analysis of was it a good decision or not a bad decision. And, and, and the, the horrible cases of where the player doesn't deliver and there are some other factors on that. What do you think are some sort of successful ways that you've seen that entrepreneurs have dealt with the high moments and the inevitable low moments? I, th I think on the high moments, it means sort of humility and sort of don't, you know, don't go, I mean, you can sort of beast your chest and stuff like that, but you're like one minute away from a kick in the guts. Uh, I'm serious. I mean, that's so I, th I think that's where the, the, the narcissistic CEO, not only does he create the problems that you say, well, we're very successful. Of, I was very successful. And he doesn't attribute that as much to the team. And so I think that's one of the most important things that uh, the really good VCs start to temper that person in terms of their praise and not make that person he or she, the face of the company all the time uh, on that. The, on, the, on the lows, uh, I actually think a lot of this scenario analysis helps you manage that process. Now, part of the problem is one low is often failed by another low, another low, and it sort of gets, and, and it happens as a business failing. And so there is a point at which you have to realize it's time to bail because it's, I mean, and that's, that's one of the hardest decisions. Uh, on that. Sometimes the other employers will be bailing anyway, so that the message will be stamped on your brain. But uh, I, th I think it's, um, the other thing is do the scenario analysis of how people do under stress. And if this person, somebody doesn't handle stress, don't join the firm, frankly. I th unless you can handle that stress, y you know that the low is going to come and then he's going to look or she's going to look for other people to blame. That's not a pretty position to be in. So. Sometimes a, a due diligence is one of the most important aspects that I take away from this research. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Just a moment. Yeah. Um, just one final thing, uh, a small gift. So Thanks thank so you much. very much. Um, you've given us many gifts in the talk today. Um, I think there's something for everyone in the talk, whether you're a founder building a business or you're supporting someone who is. Um, I think in particular for me, your point around celebrating success as close as possible to when it happens, because the more you leave it, the more something's probably going to get in the way that makes you feel not so much like celebrating anymore. Yeah. Um, so that was personally for me, you know, a really big, good takeaway. Um, with that, everyone, please uh, stay. We have some great food for you around the back. If you can stay, um, catch up um, with George if you've got other questions. Um, otherwise, we do have another event in this space starting at 4 p.m. We have Natasha Rawlings, um, who's got a great background as an investor and operator. Um, so please, if you can, join us for that event at 4 p.m. Otherwise, thank you once again, Professor George Foster.